Hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Emily Kosick and I'm the Knowledge Manager at the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment. It's my pleasure to be hosting this event made possible by a partnership with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Today, we'll be continuing our series on the research done for the post-traumatic stress injuries and public safety personnel catalyst grants. There are a few housekeeping notes before we begin the presentations. Uh, all of you are in listen-only mode. This is to limit feedback and ambient noise during the presentation. It does, however, mean that if you want to ask questions, you will have to submit them through the questions box located on your control panel. Uh, today's session is being recorded and you will receive a copy of that recording probably tomorrow in an email. Uh, so if you miss anything, don't worry, it will still be available. As I said before, do use that questions box to ask questions throughout. There will be a question session at the end. So all three projects will present first, and then we will have a general question session. Last note is some organizations do block the GoToWebinar um, system. So it does mean that if you're having trouble hearing or seeing us, the best way might be to join by phone. It's just a quirk of the system and security settings. So now I'd like to introduce our first project for the day. It is unpacking the social cultural characteristics of operational stress injuries among paramedics. Um, it's a mixed methods approach. It's going to be uh, presented by Justin Moss, a PhD candidate at McMaster University and an advanced care paramedic. Uh, Dr. Megan McConnell uh, will also be presenting assistant professor, Department of Innovation and Medical Education at the University of Ottawa. Their knowledge user for this project is Alexis Silverman. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pass control over to Justin so that he can start sharing his slides. And good luck with your presentation. Thank you. Showing main screen. Yeah, we can see your desktop at the moment, Justin. Oh, oh. there we go. So we are just seeing the presentation view, not the main slide view. So just so you know, Justin. Yep, working on it. My apologies. Give me one no second. Go to meeting is new for me. <laughs> Success. Yeah, perfect. <clears throat> okay, fantastic. Hello, bonjour. Uh, thank you very much for having me. My name is Justin. I'm a PhD candidate at McMaster University, a senior fellow with a place called the McNally Project for Paramedicine Research. Uh, and clinically, I practice as an advanced care paramedic in the region of Peel in Ontario. When we did this yesterday, my webcam wasn't working. It's nice to put a face to a name, so I included a picture of me. And for the past 15 years or so, my colleagues in Peel region have called me Dewey, because apparently I look like the Malcolm in the Middle character. Uh, and this is a picture of my dog, Sam, who's going to be 12 next month. Moving on. I would like to express our gratitude and appreciation to the members of our research team who bring an amazing wealth and diversity of expertise into this particular topic area, and also to Alexis, our community partner, who's going to be speaking later in the presentation. Standard disclosures, in addition to the Catalyst grant that funded our research, I should mention that I received graduate funding through McMaster University, and this work was approved by the Hamilton Integrated Research Ethics Board, and because my webcam isn't working, I'm wearing stretchy jeans and a hoodie. So I'm going to talk through the goals and objectives of our particular research, a little bit about the research design, our findings, recognizing that we are still gathering and analyzing data, which is very exciting. And then I'll hand it over to Alexis, who's our community partner, to talk about how this research is being used in Peel Region specifically. So speaking very broadly, our goal was to develop a contextually situated program of research that did three things. We wanted to generate robust prevalence estimates of various forms of operational stress injury among paramedics, recognizing that the ways that research has been done in this area in the past uh, have had certain methodological limitations in terms of the possibility of selection and response bias because the participant pools tended to have been very vaguely defined. And so we wanted to look at this research in the context of one service with carefully controlled participant selection and see how our findings compare. 
On a related note, we're looking at risk factors uh, and we're also looking behind the numbers to try and understand social and cultural influences as it relates to constructions of paramedic professional identity and workplace culture and how those things influence mental health. So to do this, we used a mixed methods approach to our research, specifically a convergent parallel design, uh, in which we're gathering both quantitative and qualitative data simultaneously and triangulating around this central issue of social cultural determinants of paramedic mental health. So on the quant side, this involved distributing a paper-based in-person cross-sectional survey uh, to speak to objectives one and two around prevalence and risk factors, and we used validated mental health self-report measures. And then on the qual side, we're using a constructivist grounded theory approach to explore and dig behind the numbers into issues around social issues and professional culture uh, in our particular context. And so that involved multi-stage, semi-structured interviews. Our research is situated in Peel Region. You might have heard of us. Uh, we've been on the news a lot lately. Peel Region is just to the left of Toronto in Ontario. It's serviced by Peel Regional Paramedic Services. They provide land ambulance and paramedic services to 1.3 million residents across a mixed urban and uh, suburban geography of 1,200 square kilometers. And by staffing and caseload, the region of Peel is, I believe, the second largest provider of paramedic services in the province of Ontario. And the majority of our data collection was taking place in and around the uh, continuing medical education sessions that happened in the fall of 2019, which importantly was pre-COVID, or I've also seen it described as BC for before Corona. What we did for the quant side of this was to distribute an in-person paper-based cross-sectional survey. So this involved me showing up to pretty much every CME day and handing out a written survey to all 607 people that attended the CMEs. We got 600 returned. We excluded 11 for large sections of either missing or implausible data. And that gave us a final N of 589 paramedics or a response rate of 97%, which we're, we're quite happy with. In terms of the demography of our respondents, 60% of our participants were men. Men on average were older, had more years of experience, were less likely to attend university, and more likely to practice at the advanced care paramedic level. And these differences in demographic characteristics were significant at the 5% level. We also had two folks uh, who participated in our study, one identifying as transgender and the other is another non-binary gender identity. So in terms of objective one, which was looking at our outcome measures, we want to give a little bit of context in terms of um, where our numbers, where our estimates sit in comparison to nationally representative data that's been coming out from SIPSERG from that 2018 study. So according to those data, about 25% of paramedics screen positive for depression, a third each or so for, or sorry, 25% for PTSD, a third each or so of depression and anxiety, and almost half, almost one in two screening positive for any of the three. So in that respect, our findings are encouraging. They're less than half of these estimates. And to us, what that says is that, you know, when we control, when we very carefully control participant selection uh, and use this in the context of very high response rate, the numbers are a little bit less concerning, in, in, at least in that respect. Our positive rate for PTSD was 11%. We had 15% each for depression and anxiety. But the one figure that does worry me in particular is that 25% or one in four of our participants did screen positive for any one of these three mental health outcomes. And one strength of our particular study is that this was a representation of the active duty workforce in Peel region. And so what that says is, you know, a quarter of that workforce is potentially meeting diagnosable levels of symptoms for these conditions and also that our estimates recognizing differences in the ways that these values are gathered are still higher than estimates in the Canadian population. So in terms of risk factors we explored risk factors in terms of um, demographic characteristics and we also included a self-report resilience measure called the BRS, the Brief Resilience Score. That measure has been used in this population before linked to mental health outcomes uh, and in our context what we found was that having resilience levels, self-reported resilience levels that met what the authors describe as quote-unquote low levels of resilience uh, and working full-time were fairly consistent in being associated with an increased risk of screening positive for any one of our three mental health outcomes. When we look specifically at the outcomes individually, that risk persists, so an increased risk of a positive screen uh, if the participant met the criteria for low resilience, uh, and an increased risk of a positive screen if the participant worked full time, but only for anxiety and depression, uh, but not for PTSD, even though our point estimate favors it, the compatibility interval crossed one and the uh, it didn't reach the 5% threshold. 
We did find gender differences, which in some ways is consistent with existing research in this population and in the general in the general public. So women were more likely to screen positive for anxiety and depression, but not for PTSD, which does contrast. And it is, it is worth mentioning that for this figure specifically, that this, again, although our point estimate favored um, men in this regard, the test didn't reach the 5% threshold. And then lastly, we found that people who had been or are currently members of our services peer support team had a fourfold increase in risk of screening positive for PTSD and a more than threefold increase in risk of screening positive for depression, as well as an elevated point estimate for screening positive for anxiety. But again, uh, just falling short of that 5% threshold for statistical significance. On the qual side, this was our constructivist grounded theory study. We included 21 very carefully selected participants using a purposive and theoretical sampling strategy. Uh, and this was intended to capture different years of experience, uh, people in different demographic categories, particularly around gender, as well as people with experience with uh, work-related mental illness. And our research questions very broadly focused around this big question of, you know, what does it mean to be a paramedic in terms of how they conceptualize themselves and how does that conceptualization of identity influence and relate to things around what paramedics value in a healthy and psychologically supportive workplace around the experience of work-related mental illness and being off on leave or on help seeking and importantly how are each of these things influenced or mediated or affected by gender and so I could spend hours talking about uh, the qualitative findings because it's absolutely fascinating in so many different ways. But for the sake of time, I'll just share some of our initial thoughts from the analysis that we've been doing. First and foremost, paramedicine is often a second choice career. A lot of people are telling me that they wanted to do something else but couldn't for various reasons. And a lot of them are saying, you know, they didn't know exactly what they were signing up for. And when I ask them about how their work as a paramedic relates to how they see themselves, I say, you know, if you think of your sense of self as a pie chart and paramedic as a slice, how big a slice does it typically take up? My more moderate respondents will usually tell me that it's somewhere between 25 and 50%. And some people will say even more. And they're quite open at admitting to me that that maybe is too much because if they're not able to do that work, it's very destabilizing and the effects spill over into their personal lives. And then this sense of self ultimately needs to be reconstructed during the return to work process. Kind of the overarching theme that we're getting in talking to these people is that they'll say, you know, this job just changes you. In particular, your worldview and your outlook on life and society. And so we're still digging into a lot of that. But at this point, I will hand it over to our community partner, Alexis. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today, especially about um, Dewey's phenomenal research. So in terms of the way that we are using the research here at Peel Regional Paramedic Services, is that currently I'm involved in a project for implementing the CSA standards on psychological health and safety for paramedic organizations. And the way that we are using this is to support the work that we're doing with the implementation of the standards. For example, we are looking at um, furthering our return to work program to make it more comprehensive and to ensure that um, we are helping reintegrate paramedics into the workforce uh, and helping them to regain their sense of self through paramedicine. We're also uh, going to support our peer support program to keep in contact with medics who are off on OSIs or other long-term uh, um, leave of absences in order to do the same, keep them connected to the workforce and keep them uh, with their sense of self. The We're also going to have a stronger emphasis on mentoring our new paramedics for the emotional parts of the job to help them understand and adjust to the real world environment which is something that you know we mentored them before in terms of this is how you do the job but we didn't mentor them before in terms of and this is what the job may mean to you um, the education and training for the new recruit class is going to also help build skills in the right resilience. Everyone who comes into paramedicine, into emergency services in general, has a great deal of resilience, but some of it is less supportive than others when it comes to um, dealing with the, the calls that they go on, and we want to make sure that we are uh, giving them the right kind of resilience to help them have a long career. 
And then also we are in the development of a critical call database that identifies when paramedics have attended calls of the type to potentially cause or worsen an OSI, because we are very cognizant of the fact that we already have a 25% of our workforce who has what could be a um, diagnosable OSI, and we don't want to cause more problems. We're also involved in education for paramedics and their loved ones about occupational stress injuries and what to do about that, because we uh, know from other research that a paramedic is more likely to turn to a loved one or a family member or both if they're suffering from an OSI and they want help and support. And this finding is, um, the findings from, from the study are also going to help inform the development of our new peer support program uh, in order to minimize the negative impacts on our current and future peer supporters, because that was also a stunning thing to realize, which was that our peer supporters might be injured by the volunteer position that they uh, took up upon themselves. So as you can see, lots of work being done directly in relati relation to the um, conclusions of the study, and we're really looking forward to getting the final report. And so I'm assuming that that is the end of your guys' presentation. I thank you so much for sharing with us. Great results and great to see the real world implications of the research that you're doing. I'm just going to quickly put this up here. So we're gonna move on to our next uh, presenter for the next project. And so our presenters for the, our next project that we're gonna share with you guys is uh, the development of a validate and validation of a mental health screening tool for public safety professionals. Uh, the principal uh, researcher on this is Dr. Greg Anderson from Thompson Rivers University, but the session itself is going to be presented by Dr. James Rattel from Queen's University and the knowledge user, Dr. Vivian Lee. So Vivian, I am going to pass over uh, presenter control to you right now so that you can go ahead and share your screen. And I'll let you guys proceed with your, with your presentation. Can everyone see this? Yes, looks good. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so hello and uh, good morning and happy lunchtime, depending on where you are in the country. Um, so I'm here as the knowledge user to talk about um, the validating this mental health screening tool. And of course, the PIs are uh, Dr. Gregory Anderson, Diane Grawl, and uh, Dr. Nick Carlton. And um, my co-presenter will be uh, James Retail, who is a research assistant with Diane at Queen's. So of course we know that um, the prevalence of mental health issues and PTSD in public safety is higher than that of the average population. Um, thank you for the previous presentation for highlighting that. And of course there's an important need for a mental health screening tool which, which is specifically designed to identify at-risk individuals uh, within public safety personnel. I worked for, I've been working with public safety personnel for about 10 years and uh, I worked for a number of those years at a trauma program at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, ChemH in Toronto. And uh, we, we saw people who were primarily referred through our workers' compensation in Ontario. And uh, we would get very, very lengthy, sometimes file reviews um, uh, of the clients who were coming in for assessment. And they very often included, included years of uh, their family physician's notes. And so I got to know a lot of these GP notes very, very well. And you could see there'd be years and years and years of uh, you know, the client going in to see their GP and there might be mention of physical issues like GI issues or, you know, talking about increased uh, high blood pressure. Um, you know, sometimes they might talk about stress, but not very often. And even if they did, it was a very rarely connected to their work. So you would see these individuals going in um, who had no idea what was happening with them. And they go to the doctor because that's, you know, their primary um, care physician. And then the physician was not uh, you know, kind of connecting with what might have been going on. So you saw years and years of, of, of uh, the client suffering. So I think it's really important at this primary care point um, for the physicians to be able to identify or just screen individuals who may have some mental health injuries related to their work as public safety personnel. Um, this is also important because uh, family physicians are often asked about um, the, the individual's ability to return to the workplace, whether after a physical or a mental health injury. Um, so it would be very good for them to have just some kind of screening tool to identify, should this person talk to a more specialized mental health clinician? 
Um, so the Department of Defense has um, defined psychological assessment screening as a procedure in which a standardized instrument or protocol is used to identify individuals who may be at risk for mental health disorders and suicide. So generally, they're, they're very brief. Um, they're focused on one or just a few conditions. And often they're self-administered. Of course, they can be administered by the clinician or um, a specially trained assistant. So keeping in mind, you know, the titles can be misleading to the, the lay audience, right? The PCL, the post-traumatic stress disorder checklist. Um, but, you know, emphasizing that it's not diagnosing, it's not saying this person has these uh, particular conditions, but it's just a flag, right? To the, the person doing the screening that, hey, maybe there's something going on with these particular sets of symptoms and it would be a good idea for them to speak to someone who's more specialized in this type of um, assessment. It can also help increase diagnostic, diagnostic consistency. And of course, regular screening. I talk a lot with um, public safety personnel about mental health checkups. So regular screening can help uh, public safety personnel access rapidly um, care. And uh, I mean, we, we all know individuals or have heard of individuals who have fallen between the cracks because no one could quite put their finger on what was going on. Um, so being able to just kind of regularly check in with a very brief instrument to look at, hey, is there potentially something going on here can be very, very helpful. And here's where I will pass it to uh, James to continue on. Hi folks, can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Alrighty, so I'm just going to give you a, a, a quick rundown of the methods that we actually use to generate this screening tool, and then I'll talk through some of the, our efforts to validate, uh, validate the screening tool. Um, so it was the, the data that we used to, to, to build the screening tool comes from the, the AX1 data set, uh, and it contains uh, a sample size of approximately 9,500 responses from public safety personnel um, to a, sort of a broad range of questions. And the subscales that that we were interested in, uh, we, we had data from approximately uh, roughly 6,000 uh, respondents. Um, on the, and, I'll, and I'll talk specifically about those subscales in a second. Um, on the, what you're looking at the right, on the right here is just a breakdown of the sort of sociodemographic predictors of um, sc uh, screening positive across any one of the, the subscales of interest. And I, I'm not going to spend detail going, going through each of these, except to just highlight um, down the uh, down the very bottom here, you can see the breakdown of public safety personnel who responded to this uh, the, the questionnaire. Um, so you can see we have uh, provincial police, rural Canadian mounted police, um, correctional workers, firefighters, paramedic, uh, paramedics, and call centre operators. So the oh, have you jumped to the next slide for me, Vivian. Uh, so the the Specific screen tool, uh, sorry, the specific uh, subscales of interest that we use to generate the screening tool are on the slide in front of you, and I'll I'll just quickly run through them. So we uh, took item, we we looked at the scores along the PCL5 um, as a measure of PTSD um, for depression. We had the PHQ9 uh, for panic disorder. We used the PDSSR, so the PDSSSR, um, and for anxiety, the GAD7. Uh, social interactive phobia, we use the SIPs, and to look at alcohol um, use disorders, we use the audit. So the, the goal of what we're trying to do here is basically take uh, each of those subscales, uh, so each of those scales, and reduce them down to two or three items that are predictive of the total score that someone might get along, uh, along each of those items. So, for example, um, take, find three items along the PCL5 that best predict an individual's total PCL score, PCL5 score. And then we'll do that to each of the subscales. And once we have those items, um, we, we put them all into one scale and, we, and essentially we have our screening tool. It's a, a condensed version of all of, the, all of these six sub, subscales. Uh, so to, uh, to do this, we, uh, we took the sort of approximately 6,000 responses we had, or 5,800, and we divided this into a training set and a test uh, set. And the school, was, the, the tool was developed using the training, the training data set, and then we attempted to validate it in the, the, the testing data set. And you can ask me about uh, some of the details afterwards if, if you're interested, but essentially we just ran a series of linear regressions uh, on each of the subscales to identify the best three items that together could predict total scores uh, along each of the measures. Um, and then that was sort of the statistical solution. And then 
uh, once we arrived at those items, we presented them to sort of clinicians and got some feedback on how appropriate they might be to include uh, those specific items. And there was a bit of a back and forth there. Uh, so next, yeah, next slide for me, Vivian. Thank you. Okay, so what we're looking at here is uh, sort of our efforts to, to validate the, the screening tool. So what we did is, uh, based on the items generated in the training set, we then predicted uh, responders, respondents score in the test data set along each of the, the subscales. And then what I've got here is a comparison of the predicted scores versus the actual scores along each of the measures. So um, what you can see or the takeaway from this, this slide here is essentially that the, um, the predicted scores uh, correspond quite well to the actual scores. That is, basically using the screening tool, we can get a pretty accurate estimate of what someone's total score along, these, uh, along the measures would actually be. Uh, and for anyone who's sort of uh, stat savvy, the, the slopes of these uh, in these plots have a, uh, a slope, the regression line, sorry, have a slope of one. But the takeaway is that basically the, the, predicted, the, the screening tool does a very good job of predicting total scores uh, along these measures. And similarly, uh, we, uh, in another effort to sort of validate it, what I've got here is uh, a uh, the classification accuracy of the screening tool. So, how, given someone's score on the screening tool, how well can you predict whether they will screen positive or negative on the the, the total score? Um, and I've got broken down here as the sensitivity and specificity. But um, what you can see is that using the screening tool item, so using only three items from each of these scales, you, the classification accuracy is, is reasonably quite high, quite impressive, so in uh, ranging from about 90% to about 95%. And finally here, uh, the, in addition to uh, validating this in the test data set, we also took the screening tool items and validated in a completely independent data set, this one, uh, was a, a data set of correctional officers, uh, approximately 1,200 respondents. And in this case, we were able to get a classification accuracy of about 90 to 93%. Um, so quite high given that the, 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 it was a completely separate uh, uh, independent data set. And that, that's all for me. Back to you, Vivian. Great, thanks, James. Um, so you can see here that, um, so looking at the R results, that we could classify into to three main categories. So, um, you know, if there was a score of 13 that um, suggested that they had a probability of, of scoring, screening positive on any of the measures that were um, that were assessed 50%. Um, so they are in the green category and so on. You could see at the yellow category and, and red category. So this provides a very nice, clean, useful way of, uh, for the family physician to just look and say, okay, well, you're in the yellow or red, it's probably a good idea for you to speak to a mental health professional. So in terms of uh, what we're doing with this, so in terms of the screening tool, further validation and use is encouraged. Um, and questions in the tool can be randomized. Um, they're not in the blocks of questions. Uh, we engage one postdoc, one doctoral, and one master's, and one undergraduate student. Um, and as well as 20 public safety personnel who provided feedback on the tool. And um, PIs will engage knowledge users in a formal dissemination meeting. Uh, one poster has been presented as well as two oral knowledge translation presentations at um, the last in-person um, Simper Forum. And there are plans to submit three peer-reviewed articles. And I just, I find this very exciting, um, the clinician nerd in me. Just, I, you know, I've, I've seen so many people who by the time they made it to my office, there there was a lot of suffering and a lot of um, there was lack of recognition that there was something going on. And by the time they realized something was going on and that could be related to work, and then they reached out for help, you can imagine how far down the road they've gone. So, for public safety personnel to just be able to go to their doctors and just get the screening tool every once in a while, and be able to to um, flag problems early. This way they can get help much earlier along the line than waiting till things have kind of fallen apart around them. I believe we're saving questions to the end, so I will uh, pass it back. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Do a quick change over here.
All right, so we do have one more uh, project to present for you guys today. And that group is going to be talking to us about mapping resilience pathways and preferences for help seeking among police services in the context, context of post-traumatic stress injuries. And it's a community engaged research project uh, that was in Ontario. And I am just going to pass it over uh, the presentation over to one of the presenters here so she can get it set up. All right, so our presenters for today are, for this project are going to be Dr. Elena Suarez and Eleanor McGrath. Their knowledge user is Amanda Francesini. Hopefully I said that right, Amanda. I apologize if I didn't. And um, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys do that presentation. Okay. Uh... Eliana, you want me to start? I believe it's, it's here already. <laughs> Sorry. I, it, did, you can see the show screen? Yeah. Uh, did you put the screen? I yeah, we can see it. Yeah. You can see it? Great. Oh, now it's gone okay. for me. I don't know. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, uh, our our uh, presentation is uh, a little bit different than the previous two because we are actually focused on uh, resilience pathways and health-seeking preference among public safety person personnel, in particular for members of the police services in Ontario. Uh, so let me introduce just quickly who we are. Uh, is uh, 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 my name is Eliana Suarez. I am the uh, PI of this project uh, from uh, the Faculty of Social Work at Will Laurier University. Uh, with me are right now Eleanor McGraw, that is our research associate from the same university, and we are so privileged to have the presence also of our knowledge user, Amanda Francischini, she's the strategic planner from the Waterloo Regional Police Services. Uh, our research team is actually very interdisciplinary. As I mentioned, I am the PI, the co-PI is Dr. Uh, Jeanette Lafreniere, who is uh, also from the Faculty of Social Work of Wilfrid Laurier. Then the co-investigator is Dr. Frank Arocha from Public Health in the University of Waterloo. And we have three collaborators, uh, Dr. Abdel El Chakiri uh, from Social Work Laurier, uh, Dr. Sandra Hoy for Social Work Laudation University, and Dr. Frank Sirotich, that um, he is from CMHA Toronto, is the director of the research programs there, and also uh, adjunct professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, at Toronto. Our uh, our grant was definitely based and grounded in. I'm very grateful for our advisory committee, who is uh, uh, how we have current and former police members who were um, involved from the beginning in the design of the, of the project, that is a mixed methods project, and also uh, in the validation of instruments and everything. We have had different research trainees, uh, research associate, five graduate level research assistants, and one undergrad research assistant. Uh, we, unfortunately, our conference were that we were planning, they were early on in this year and they were canceled for COVID. Probably we have a couple of more on the wall and definitely we plan to have two open access peer review uh, uh, journal articles at this point. Um, Eleanor, can you continue from that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so our project had three different uh, components to it, uh, three different phases. And so the first phase was the online survey, which uh, this presentation is going to be focusing on the results of the online survey. So I will talk much more about that in a second. The second phase was follow up interviews. And so it was done using snowball sampling from the online survey. So we asked in the online survey if people were interested in having a follow up interview. 
um, and we had immense interest in the follow-up interviews. And I'll talk a little bit about timelines in a second, but just for some context, we were just wrapping up the online survey in February. And so there was immense interest. And then when it came time to actually do the interviews, of course, we were well into COVID. Um, and so uh, we still had a very, very strong response for our interview portion, but not, not quite as strong as the interest that we initially saw. Um, and then we also asked uh, participants for visual representations of resilience. So send us a picture or some other visual representation of what resilience means to you. And we got some really interesting uh, submissions for that. Eliana, can you do the next slide? Sure. Awesome. Thank you. Uh yeah, okay. Uh, so for the online survey, so for recruitment, we did outreach to 29 police services across Ontario, um, plus other networks such as the Ontario Chiefs Association, Badge of Life, um, related post-secondary programs, and several of the police services promoted the research directly to their members, uh, some of them by way of an official email or posting on their internal portal, uh, some of them a little bit less formally through um, like a, a designated Facebook group and things like that. But uh, we were very, very fortunate to have several police services promoting our research uh, to their members. Um, and then the Ontario Chiefs Association and Badge of Life and the post-secondary programs also did the same. So as I mentioned before, um, we had our online survey open from the fall of 2019 and into February, 2020. We had 241 respondents, uh, both active and former members, representing more than 10 police services across Ontario. And our topic areas that we were looking at uh, were resilience using the CD risk uh, scale, um, attitudes toward mental health treatment, health literacy, and help seeking preferences. So for doing the analysis of our uh, um, the results from the online survey, we um, um, because we were interested in investigating the resilience pathways of uh, actual individuals who survive well despite all the despite all the level of occupational stress, uh, we use a structural equation modeling analysis using the software of M plus, and they were individual factors and predicting directly and indirectly uh, resilience uh, uh, depending of attitudes and social contextual factors. The model fitness was actually an excellent fit to the data, so we were pretty happy with this result. Uh, the, all the indicators, the statistical indicators demonstrating uh, an excellent value uh, on this fitness. And this is kind of the visual representation of this model. Uh, as you can see in the right side, that is resilience. It was measured by the Connor Davison resilience scale. And that is at the direct uh, path where, are from the attitudes towards mental health treatment. So basically measuring kind of stigma or not and accessing mental health services. And the other linear that it directly was with life satisfaction and with a, a sense of belonging with community. Uh, it is complex and is it, and is definitely uh, multi-directional in the, in this way, but um, it, it, it presents a clear way how integrated the professional life and the personal life are in the in the development of resilience. Uh, the direct factors who were in influencing resilience definitely are self-rated mental health life satisfaction, the sense of community belonging, and the attitudes towards mental health treatment. And indirectly are, uh, are also other individual predictors via life satisfaction and via community belonging. Uh, we have to really, I really like to emphasize that this, these findings were before COVID and before uh, uh, all the June uh, terrible events that um, they renovate all the racial justice movement. Uh, we wonder is we probably we are going to have a second round of interviews at least to just reflect how the stressors of these two events may be affecting uh, all our participants in, in a different way. Amanda? Hello. 
Thank you. I'm happy to have been a contributing organization towards these findings. I work in strategic services, and so part of my portfolio is liaising with academic partnerships. It's also developing our strategic business plan in partnership with our police services board. So this is very timely because we are in the point in our business planning cycle where we're using scanning information to help us develop priorities over the next three years. So to know that there is that relationship between personal and professional lives and to see some of these results about how people are accessing health information and some of the direct and indirect paths to resiliency, they're all very important. Um, our police services board recognizes the importance of the wellness of our members because if we don't have members who are well and at work, then we aren't providing police services to the community. And we even have a staff sergeant in a wellness unit, and that position didn't exist three years ago. And not only now does it exist, but now they're also being tasked with developing different strategies. So over the next three years, they will be building a wellness 2.0 strategy, a suicide prevention strategy, a pandemic wellness strategy. And so we're going to need this kind of information as you know, evidence-based support for how we tackle that. Uh, I'll also emphasize too, I'm a member of the peer support team at work. And you know, we enter stats on a monthly basis in terms of you know, people we reach out to and, and the ways we reach out to them. And we need those stats to justify our training budget. But a piece like this where we've got some evidence-based results will also support the existence of our peer support team. So I would say that this is excellent news for us to, to have in terms of developing our priorities. Um, the data geeks in our office will appreciate things like those models. When I translate it to our greater membership, I will do so more in the form of this take home messages slide. So emphasizing the importance of life satisfaction and community belonging so that we can take that broader approach. And the absence of gender as a factor in the model is interesting as well. Um, perhaps we're on the right track where we're reducing stigmas and uh, it's just uh, gonna, again, factor into how we approach the transmission of this information and some of these strategies. So I hope that helps the presentation in terms of the knowledge user perspective. I'll pass it back over to our investigators. Thank you, Amanda. And our next step, as uh, we just commented before, is continue further analysis of these quantitative findings, uh, especially in the area of health seeking preference that so far indicate, as Amanda mentioned, definitely peer support programs rather than other kind of professional health. Uh, the analysis of the qualitative interviews and the visual representations of resilience and dissemination of all of the above. And um, thank you so much. At First of all, of all the participants in our research, our advisory committee that has been uh, beyond and above their commitment with the research, uh, CIHR, of course, and everyone today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it was wonderful. It's good to hear such uh, interesting information. And I always like to see knowledge users uh, finding value in, this, in, our, in the information that we are sharing. So I'm going to move to the question portion now of the session. And uh, thank you for everybody for staying on time. So we do have uh, 15 minutes for questions. If you haven't already submitted a question and have one, uh, please go ahead. Uh, it is always easier if you indicate the project you want the question for, but I'm pretty good at figuring out who to ask. So um, first question is going to be for uh, the project one team. And they wanted, the person wants to thank you, of course, for the presentation. And they do want to know, based on the experience that you've had uh, with your, with your uh, participants, what calls, what calls seem to cause operational stress injuries versus the calls that don't? And what beliefs strengthen and, and, and enhance resilience based on your findings? That's so a big over. question. It is. It's a, it's, a, it's a super important one, but it's a very big question. Probably best, Alexis, are you here? Because you've been working on the back end on the sort of early warning system they're developing. Yeah, so um, 
if we're just talking in general about the early warning system, we are basing our research and other research that has been done on fire services uh, in Australia and the states looking at basically themes of calls that have a tendency to lead the participants or the, the emergency first responders to an OSI in uh, the future. Um, so we are building our database from that, but also knowing that there's no science of the individual and so every individual is going to be affected differently by every call that they go to and so we also have to build the other end which is what i think justin was referring to which is um making sure that people have the right kind of resilience to begin with even before those those calls are faced and also the um the other aspect which is what is the culture of our organization because re you can be as resilient as a person can possibly be and if your organization keeps pounding you into the ground, you are not going to be able to overcome the slings and arrows that are um, sent your way. So we have to, to work on all of those ends. We have to identify the bad calls. We have to build resiliency in case we don't know what the bad call is for a particular individual. And we have to make our institution as supportive as possible in order to help mitigate um, the effects of of in unsupportive leadership. And so where Dewey's research becomes incredibly important for that is identifying basically where our, our sore points are, are already, what our people are facing already, where they are at already, and then identifying themes from that, which will help inform everything else we do. Did an that answer your question okay? I think it was a great answer. <laughs> so I'm gonna take it. Um, I am gonna ask okay. you, yeah, I'll, I'll let you off the hook for the, for anything else. <laughs> uh, so I am going to ask group number two the next question. And first of all, the uh, uh, questioner does want to say that the uh, screening sounds great. They want to know what would help improve uptake of this screening tool within clinics, but also within public uh, safety personnel departments. Uh, and what do you see as the barriers uh, that would have to be overcome to make it uh, have good uptake? So I'll turn that over to group two. I will start and to answer that, and, and then others can jump in. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that we need to do is uh, the last part of our project that hasn't been completed yet is to actually meet with um, the psychological providers um, for public safety. And it was supposed to be at a face-to-face -face meeting, and obviously that was, was canceled due to COVID. And we, we've been waiting to hold uh, an event with the actual service providers to introduce them to the tool and the utility of the tool and talk about um, what they might be able to gain by creating a conversation. The tool is really something that gives the physician data to create a conversation and from that conversation to get them to do early help seeking behaviors. Um, so what we need to do is, is engage that group. And we also need to then take that out to the occupational groups as well. And again, most of those venues for, for that information haven't happened this year. So I think there's two prongs. One, we need to go to each of the public safety organizations and say, this is what we've done. This is how it might be able to be used. For example, it may be embedded in a national nursing, um, frontline nursing questionnaire and it may be embedded in a national public safety questionnaire moving forward so we're going to then also be able to help validate the tool moving forward with more data and then look at its utility so there's sort of three things one is to to get others to to validate the tool um, using data that they collect embedding it in questionnaires that they've used making sure that the um, services each know that it exists and then the third part is making sure that we can address the, the service providers for each of those organizations to say, this is what the screening tool is, this is what you might be able to use it for, and this might be its utility. And I'll just add to that um, in terms of um, having family physicians uh, administer it or, or um, screen the, the patient. Uh, the, Family doctors are obviously slammed as it is, and uh, we, so we have to make the, the burden on them as minimal as possible. So this is why I really like the just the green, yellow, red uh, flag. So just knowing the family physicians, knowing that they they don't have to do all this stuff. It's you know here's the result. You may want to go talk to a mental health professional. And I think at the um, the public safety 
level, um, I think it's really important that the frontline understand that this is not diagnostic, no information is going to the um, employer, and that this is simply a screening tool, um, no diagnosis is going in your file, and your employer will not find out anything about this. I mean, we all know that as uh, clinicians and researchers, but of course, you know, the um, the perception on the front line is, what, is all that really matters, so just hammering out that education as well. Perfect, great Thanks, point. Uh, so group three, next question is for you. Um, so the person is asking that there was a point indicated early in your presentation regarding preliminary findings around formal versus informal peer support. They're wondering if you can offer more detail on that point and they thank you for doing the study to begin with. So group three, if you want to go ahead and provide uh, some information. Yeah, I can actually speak to that a little bit. Um... Sorry, I just want to pull up my extra info that I've got here on the side. Um, so yeah, we looked at help seeking preferences and one of the things that we did find was that people by and large didn't prefer formal supports. They preferred informal supports. So when we asked them like, where are you most likely to go get help from? They responded, you know, family, friends or trusted colleague. Um, it was not necessarily 100% clear whether when they, because it was a check all that apply. Um, so when they said a trusted colleague, there was also on that list, you know, a peer support program or an EAP or, you know, other formal mental health support. So definitely the trusted colleague could have been like you might have ticked both if you were talking about a peer support program as well as a trusted colleague just like a coworker or a friend at work. Um, but it was all those informal supports that came out as the highest uh, in terms of where people prefer to get their help from. Um, and so we found that to be really, really interesting because of course, you know, every organization within police services, within other public safety personnel, and even outside of, of that realm, you know, offers all kinds of, you know, EAPs, or peer support programs, and formal support programs. And in our data, it was actually the informal supports that came out as, as most uh, helpful for participants. I hope that answered the question. For sure. And I, I just wanted to follow up with that and just say that in the research that we've seen through SIPSERT, we also see that like family members and more informal supports are also quite common versus a formal peer support system. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you for that answer, Eleanor. It was great. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, project number one, uh, group one. Uh, question for you is, um, do you believe the real paramedic mental health rates for all of Canada are much lower than in the Canada paper based on the results from your PL sample? And do you think the non-anonymous data collection method may have impacted your results? So, Justin, Another really important question. Yeah, it's super exciting. I'm happy to talk about it. One of the reasons that we put the study together in the way that we did was that we recognized that as valuable as the information that's been put out to this point is in drawing attention to this super, super important topic, that there are you know, very understandable methodological limitations in terms of how that data is gathered. So by circulating um, surveys over the internet through professional associations, and even though that we're going across Canada looking at the SIPSER data most recently, which is very informative, but it does create this opportunity for what in research we would describe as a selection or response bias. And so it means that, you know, we could over or underestimate prevalence in that particular respect. And when you talk to people who do that type of work, they say, you know, usually if there is the possibility of this bias, it's probably going to zero out. And so we wanted to kind of test that hypothesis by using the same screening tools and much the same methodology, but in one service. And in one service that's kind of more or less representative of paramedic services in the province of Ontario, and by having that really tight participation control. So while our survey was anonymous, to get to the second part of your question, our response rate of 97% uh, for a prevalence study is pretty good. Usually you want that to be in the 70, 70 plus percent range if you're gonna be making claims about generalizability, and we're really happy with where we got. Perfect, thank you for that answer. All right, uh, group number two. So this person's um, asking a question, specifically read the physician, physician documentation that was mentioned in the presentation. They're saying that uh, w, sorry, WSIB or uh, WCB in other provinces criteria indicate that 
um, compensatable incidence has to be one that's attributed to a single event. Uh, their work has indicated that physicians are very mindful of how they document work-related injuries. So do you think that that will make a, a difference um, when you're using a tool like this one? Um, because you may be creating a, a record of, um, screen, of screening and stress that may uh, affect any WCB case or WSIB case. Um, so I can speak to that um, at first. So uh, that's, a, that's a great point. That's actually not something I, I had thought of. So yeah, it would be great in terms of uh, that kind of documentation. Um, it, it's a bit different in Ontario, of course, because we, um, since the presumptive legislation for PTSD was, um, was passed in 2016, I have found just in my clinical experience that um, WCIB has been much, much less, let's say, diligent in, uh, in tracking down all those records because they are, they're they're um, accepting the diagnosis much more easily. Um, I understand in other provinces that's not the case, and certainly um, if it's not PTSD, that can certainly be the case here as well. And um, yeah, so it, I've, I've seen them kind of comb through years and years and years of, of notes and comments on how there's nothing there. So even just kind of that plague of, you know, patient X screened, you know, yellow for, you know, on the public screening uh, screening tool, that's still some things. That's a really good point. And, and I'll just follow up. We did do work on implementation of presumptive legislation and uh, how that has rolled out across Canada and, and where some of the hangups were from each of the different um, perspectives. So we had uh, user, like the, the um, practitioners, we had um, the, the people that are doing the screening, we, we had uh, the unions in the room, we had a whole mix of, of groups to try and look at implementation and made recommendations back to BC in particular around inclusion and interpretation of the legislation that was passed. Happy to say that they've changed the legislation since then to address some of the concerns. Um, so I think um, if we roll this type of, of work out, we're going to see, as Vivian said, a, a lot um, easier transition for people that have an initial screen that, that's flagged to move forward and, and get a case accepted. Um, the, the provinces really differ on whether it's one single thing or not. Um, so I think that is something that we beat at in, in our report was that it's an accumulation of um, stress and, and events and that there may be a straw that broke the camel's back, to, so to speak. But um, that accumulation of, of experience in that occupation would have an impact uh, on that trajectory and that they needed to recognize that. And I think that is also being more recognized across Canada at this point. Perfect, thank you for that answer. Uh, I am gonna do one last question with our group three, just so that we're all uh, equal. So the question is, uh, your, your uh, information indicated that belonging was one of the key uh, factors or a factor uh, that you were seeing for real resiliency. Uh, the person wants to know how the feeling of belonging to the service may uh, hinder or help their belonging to the community or their resiliency uh, because many people report feelings of being betrayed from their service following a diagnosis of PTSD. So um, how can services better respond and what can clinicians do to help in the trenches? So that's the question for group number three. Sorry, it's kind of a complex one and it's a last question. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer it uh, if anybody wants to answer it. <laughs> Thank you. This is a great question, that, and, and definitely it's a very complex one. Uh, but sense of belonging to the service, at least feeling on the service, was one of the variables in the survey. But as you see in the in the pathways for resilience, it didn't have any significance. So that means that it was not enough probably determine it was a factor with not enough a strong uh, impact in how uh, people were feeling uh, more resilient uh, in, in contrast with a sense of community belonging but definitely it is and likely this um, the attitudes towards mental health treatment also were 
kind of associated with the services in that way because the, the giving the preference for informal services or peer support or peer support networks uh, make that um, link that the, uh, the, uh, the question is uh, uh, is telling us that is is you don't feel you know at uh, at, uh, safe in the in the service, probably you won't trust how that uh, uh, the sense of belonging uh, in that will be detrimental of accessing services or or just to to ask for help. Uh, I don't know, this Amanda, would you like to ask uh, add something from from the the police services directly? Well, it will be interesting to explore a little further just because we are in the middle of doing our own member survey. So we do ask questions about whether our members identify with, say, our strategic direction or if they feel like they have uh, preferences for supports as well. And uh, identifying whether they have that feeling of belonging to the service and whether it translates into a sense of belonging with the community, that's, that's an interesting question. I know in the Waterloo Region, there was a survey done done among youth in the area and sense of belonging also came up as something we need to work on. So this sense of belonging is a rising concern um, and it seems to be emerging in a few different ways. So I think it's worth us taking a closer look at internally for sure. Okay, perfect, thank you so much for that answer. Uh, I wanna take the opportunity again to thank all of our presenters and especially our knowledge users for giving us their time today and being here to share this important research. Uh, as we uh, reach the end of the session, we wanna ask you to complete the survey that will appear at the end of the session. You'll receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a video of today's session. Um, we hope that you will join us for our next virtual town hall on December 10th. It is titled Public Safety Personnel Experiences of the Opioid Crisis. It'll be a great opportunity to hear from frontline workers how this ongoing crisis is affecting them. We'll also be continuing the post-traumatic stress injury series on November 17th. If you haven't signed up already, the link is available on our website and it will also be in the follow-up email. Thank you all for being here today. Please take care and stay safe.